Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome or welcome back to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, my name is Emlyn Costa, the director of the museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you on this sultry summer evening when you had many choices of what to do. But how enlightened are you to come to a Greg Fischel town hall? Thank you very much. Uh, a few introductory contexts um, before we proceed with the introductory formalities. Um, why, you might ask, is a Earthrise shot from NASA in the late 60s on the screen? Well, um, it's there because in 1948, the uh, famous British astronomer, Sir Frederick Hoyle, said, um, and I almost quote, that once a photograph of the Earth is taken from the outside, uh, new ideas as important as any in history will be let loose. That was in 1948. He could not know, nor could anybody at the time, three years or so after the Second World War, how soon that photograph would be taken. But of course, when President Kennedy said in the early 60s that by the end of this decade, we're going to put a person on the moon, and that vision held true, uh, it was in the summer of 69 that uh, NASA successfully deployed Apollo uh, in one of its missions to land on the moon, and then we sort of really had a revolution of perspective about humans' place in the greater world. Um, and so uh, Frederick Hoyle's vision or prescient statement became true that it did unleash uh, ideas as great as any in history. And many regard Apollo's photograph of the Earth hanging there with its wafer-thin atmosphere as being one of the most powerful, iconic photographs ever taken because it prompted a whole new realization, as many of you know and were living as I was at that time. I remember watching the crackly images of, of them stepping down onto the lunar surface when I was at the University of Sheffield in England. Um, but that one small step obviously unleashed an environmental movement um, that would lead to the first Earth Day in 1970. And the uh, Environmental Protection Agency was formed in the next year, maybe not in direct consequence, but essentially the words environment followed and then sustainable development followed with the Brundtland Commission for the United Nations uh, Conference on Sustainability and Development in 1980 or so. And here we are in 2016. Um, the next slide, please. I don't, oh, I have the control. So that's why this image is here, to remind us that um, uh, of the context with which we come to think about the planet from a holistic perspective. And uh, more recently, as you may know, the United Nations has, um, in its latest version of what measures might make the human interaction with planet Earth more sustainable, have issued this matrix of 17 sustainable development goals, um, which is just a summary slide because obviously behind each one of these icons is a whole explanation of what we should try to do. Uh, this museum has taken a, a very positive step by using the vehicle of town halls and one like tonight to uh, address and to sort of uh, um, throw open uh, various of these goals, particularly the science-related ones. We've been dealing uh, in past town halls with climate change. In the fall, we'll deal with life on land. And in next, uh, after Christmas, after the end of this year, we'll deal with one to do with human health. And so it goes. We're very grateful that uh, Capital Broadcasting and WREL are um, very keen sponsors of this series. And I'm very pleased to have um, uh, Capital Broadcasting President and CEO Jim Goodman here this evening. And uh, in a moment, I'll introduce his senior colleague. But let me just show you, I think, one other slide. And that is that. Um, we go to the mighty um, uh, Einstein, who said, among his many famous quotations, that uh, to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creation and marks real advances in science. So this is about asking questions. And there's really a never-ending agenda of questions to be asked in science. And, as was sort of semi-jokingly said over lunch with Greg Fischel today, you know, a lot of the public seems to think that it's either that or it's this. It's, it's, it's that or it's something else. And there's really 
uh, such a simple situation of one being right, one being wrong. In fact, that's hard to even think of a situation. And yet that's how the public sees science. And really, it's, it's, uh, there's so many it's before you get to the big it. And the big it is always evolving, and that's the progress of science. And so it applies to energy options as much as it applies to human health, as much as it applies to the management of ecosystems. So uh, with that as a backdrop, let me ask um, uh, my colleague Steve Hamill, the Vice President of Capital Broadcasting and uh, emblematic of the important sponsorship behind this series, which is really world leading. Uh, I mentioned to a few of you, I'll just mention quickly that UNESCO in Paris has asked the Science Museum field worldwide to do what it can to, to tackle sustainable development goals of the United Nations and to um, come about with novel program ideas uh, in order to, um, to sort of bring these in front of their audiences. And we've, we've concluded that dialogue in a town hall forum is a very good way to do that, uh, pursuant to this museum's mission of illuminating the interdependence of nature and humanity and asking questions of what do we know, how do we know, what's happening now, and how do I get involved? Please welcome Steve Hamill, the Vice President of Capital Broadcasting. Thank you, Elmwin. Oh, I, I didn't think this many people were not playing Pokemon. Uh, but uh, we're here to hear initially soon from Fischelmann. Uh, it, it, is this an amazing place or what? Uh, tonight's town hall meeting is the 14th event here today. Thirteen other sessions took place in this museum today of varying topics. Uh, meet the animals, tiny giants, the list goes on and on. Uh, this museum is really super pro progressive. And in many aspects, it's ahead of the curve in the science museum field. Tonight's town hall is a continuation of our partnership with the museum to inform and educate those of us living here in North Carolina. At our core, thanks to Jim Goodman, CBC, Capital Broadcasting Company, and WRL-TV, is in the communication business. We communicate news, entertainment, information. We just launched a new experimental channel utilizing ATSC 3.0. It is the next generation of television. Tonight, we hope to educate the next generation in our community, learning what we can about the environment, economy, and entrepreneurship. Is clean energy good business? We're really proud to partner with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences on this form of communication. As you know, Greg Fischel is really into the science. He's been with us for more than three decades, in fact, 35 years. And of late, he's been searching for having education on climate change. It's taken courage to do this, and I'm really proud that Greg is doing that in conjunction with Emlyn and his team here at the Science Museum. Greg? Thank you, Steve, very much, and Jim. Um, and I just, you know, I don't mean this to sound like a mutual admiration society here. I am being honest and truthful with you. Um, that um, this is an amazing company to work for. It's one of the last locally owned TV stations in the country. And uh, the neat thing about that is you don't have to go through all sorts of uh, uh, corporate red tape uh, to get things done if somebody believes in what you're suggesting. And uh, just in the last couple of years, I've had a chance to, you know, go to uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and to go up to Barrow, Alaska, which is one of my childhood dreams to, to do that. Most people's childhood dreams are to go to exotic islands. Mine was to go to Barrow, Alaska. Uh, but uh, I am a little weird that way. Um, but anyways, uh, and I've just been given a tremendous amount of freedom and opportunity to talk about things that... Uh, that maybe not everybody else is given the encouragement to talk about. And so I, I want Jim and Steve and 
and uh, Mr. Rothschild back there all to know how much I appreciate that. All righty, so tonight uh, we're talking about uh, clean energy and whether or not it is uh, good business or not. And uh, like anything, there are very few things in this world that are inherently good across the board. Uh, there's always downsides uh, to everything, no matter how positive it may look uh, in, in the foreground. And so I really hope that we can attack some of that tonight and, uh, and really take an honest look. And I, I pleaded on Facebook and Twitter and on TV and on Facebook Live this week uh, that I didn't want this to be a preaching to the choir uh, session tonight, that I wanted people that had uh, different views and different ideas because I think that's what we're lacking in this country right now, that we've gotten into this binary state. Uh, and uh, Bob Inglis, who you'll hear from later, talks about this tribal loyalty uh, where you pick a tribe and you walk in lockstep with that tribe on every single issue. And if you deviate on any one of them, you're out of the tribe. Well, how helpful is that? <laughs> um, I remember a day when politically that uh, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan would actually have discussions. They didn't agree on much, but they respected each other and they broke bread together and maybe had a drink or whatever. And now it seems like if you're even seen with a member of the other party, you're, you're uh, you know, doing some terrible deed. So uh, I'm, that's one of my real passions in the last couple of years is to try to fight that and to try to get us back to the point where we can have civil discussions about things we don't see eye to eye about. So our first speaker tonight is Jordan Kern uh, from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, he's actually originally from Mebane, uh, which immediately my wife was drawn to because they have good outlets there. And so they got along great. Uh, but anyways, he is, uh, works for the Institute of the Environment uh, at UNC. And the first discussion we had, I was very impressed by the fact that he is interested in economics and the environment, but he's willing to admit uh, that there are going to be losers in any transition like this, and that uh, it's our responsibility to, to find out, you know, who those losers are going to be and do everything we can to help them uh, through that process. So uh, I, I'm very confident that you're going to enjoy his talk and his comments tonight. He's very objective, very fair, and I want to introduce you to Jordan Kern. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Is the mic on? Do I have to stand here? I can't pace? <sighs> okay. Uh, well, thanks very much for the invitation to, to speak today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Ah, there we go. Um, when, when Greg invited me, uh, I'll tell you that I was a little worried that I was the right choice uh, because I think uh, Bob Inglis and I share the same views on 99% of this, and he's a better messenger than I am. Uh, so I had to think hard about what exactly I wanted to say tonight, and I decided to rely on uh, one of the differences between uh, him and me. Uh, and I'm going to oversimplify the very valuable work that he does, but he spends a lot of time talking to more conservative folks that may be skeptical uh, about climate change or the need to do something about it. Uh, and he tries to nudge them just a little bit uh, to the left, whereas I spend my time interacting with these folks. Uh, so, and you do not need to explain or try to convince students uh, that climate change poses an, an existential threat, right? But in some cases, at least at first, students may lack an appreciation for how complicated an issue this is, and how difficult it may be to solve when the rubber meets the road. So I like to think that part of my role as a professor at UNC is to interact with people that are probably to the left of me, ideologically, and try to nudge them just a little bit to the right. So what I thought I'd do tonight is try to add some context uh, to the discussion of renewable energy and climate change. I want to talk about where things stand now, uh, some near-term challenges that we may face, and then also this idea of unintended consequences uh, that we may be faced with uh, if we rapidly transition away from fossil fuels. So here's the first bit of context. Uh, this is a pie chart that shows global greenhouse gas emissions by sector. 
And the point of this is to illustrate, oh, the percentages are a little messed up. Um, the point of this is to illustrate that the need for action on climate change is not limited to the electric power sector, right? Even if we get a grid that is 100% renewable energy, we may only still be 60% of the way there, right? But I'm optimistic about our ability to reduce emissions in these other areas as well. And part of that optimism stems from the very rapid changes that are occurring in the electric power industry. And one of those is a decline in greenhouse gas emissions, right? So U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector peaked around 2008 and have declined since then. And we expect them to continue to decline. And you may suspect that this is due to increased adoption of renewable energy, and you would be partly correct, right? But the reality is that a big reason why emissions have declined is because of the coal to natural gas switch, right? So over the last several years in the United States, we've, ret we've retired about 20% of existing coal-fired power plants, and they're largely being replaced with natural gas power plants, which emit 50% less carbon dioxide. And there are two important drivers for why this has happened. The first is regulation, right? We've passed, not legislatively, but we've targeted coal-fired power plants pretty specifically uh, with a series of regulations. The other really important, important development is fracking. So horizontal hydraulic fracturing, which is this new way to get oil and gas out of the ground. And fracking has dramatically expanded the domestic supply of natural gas in the United States and driven prices to historical lows. So it makes it more attractive to switch from coal to natural gas. But I know we cannot just settle for a 50% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we have to get to 100% or very, very close to it. Now there is great uncertainty and debate within the electric power industry about how to do that. And we still have not finalized our answers to a series of rather fundamental questions, including what technologies are we going to rely on? Now, the default answer in the U.S. and many parts of the world is wind and solar. But there is a strong contingent of people that are very concerned about climate change that think we should broaden that portfolio to include other low-carbon options, including nuclear and carbon capture and storage. What policies and regulations do we need? Is it going to be a carbon tax, cap and trade, something else? Let's ask Bob. <laughs> What's the best business model? Are we going to rely on traditional vertically integrated utilities like Duke Energy? Or is it going to be some other model like a third party, like Solar City? Or are we going to approach this point in the near future where individual consumers can viably and affordably provide their own electricity? Uh, these are all questions we do not have answers to at the moment uh, that we will have to figure out in the next couple of decades. But one thing that has become increasingly clear is that variable renewable energy, so wind and solar, are going to play a massive role, even though it doesn't seem like it, right? This is what we currently get our electricity from in the United States, and wind and solar is, is a pretty small percentage here. We are still overwhelmingly reliant on coal, nuclear, and natural gas. But behind the scenes, growth in wind and solar has been extraordinary in the last couple of years. And again, there are two important drivers for this. The first is policy, right? On the federal and state level, there have been policies put in place that encourage, and in some cases mandate, adoption of wind and solar by utilities. The other really important driver is economics. Uh, in particular, the falling cost of both wind and solar. And that, that cost decline is particularly breathtaking if you look at solar, right? Especially if you compare how, what the price of solar panels uh, was in the 70s and 80s to what it is today. And we expect that the price for both uh, solar and wind to decline uh, in, in, in the coming decade. And so North Carolina has not been immune uh, to this growth in renewable energy. Uh, now, from a very narrow, purely financial standpoint, solar makes a little less sense here because we already have really cheap electricity prices. Um, but we have a history, believe it or not, a very strong solar policy in North Carolina that has encouraged growth 
of utility scale solar. Uh, to the point that North Carolina is now the third leading state in the country in installed solar capacity. So all of that is good news. I mean, I think depending on who you talk to, the coal to natural gas switch is good news. Uh, the growth in renewable energy is great news. But we are still faced with some very fundamental challenges when it comes to getting to 100% renewable energy anytime soon. And these are challenges that we're going to face even if we have good policy, even if we have a carbon tax. And the first is engineering and technology constraints. So there are fundamental difficulties when it comes to directly replacing a coal-fired power plant with wind and solar. And I'll tell you why. So if, if I'm an electric utility, if I'm Duke Energy, it's my job to meet electricity demand every hour of the day, every day of the year, without fail. And the way I would do that is by stacking different types of generation in each hour of the day. And I start with coal, I start with nuclear, and then in a really high demand hour, I would use natural gas and hydropower. Now, part of the difficulty here is that we use coal as a baseload resource, which means we turn it on and we leave those plants on for hours, days, weeks at a time. You cannot replace that functionality right now with solar because it's only available during the middle part of the day. You also can't replace it with wind, right? Wind is also variable. And there's an additional wrinkle with wind, and that is it's not only variable, but it's also unpredictable. So it's variable and we don't know on a day-to-day -day basis how it's gonna vary. So one day it might look like this, the next day like this, and so on. So the good news on this front is that there are a lot of people who are way smarter than me working on ways to convert renewable energy into a resource that we can dispatch or schedule uh, consistently throughout the day. And whoever solves that problem, it will be the world's next billionaire. So the other issue, the other challenge that we face is financial inertia, right? So the, the electric power industry is extremely capital intensive, which means it takes a lot of money to build infrastructure, to build power plants. That money is borrowed and it's paid off over a really long period of time, just like a mortgage. And so the way that I've heard executives at electric power utilities describe this challenge of overcoming financial inertia to switch from fossil fuels to renewable energy is with an analogy. And they describe this challenge as having to turn a really, really big ship 180 degrees. And what that means is that even if the cost of renewable energy falls below the cost of electricity from fossil fuels, utilities still might not switch, at least not right away, if they haven't paid off the mortgage for all the fossil fuel plants, uh, plants they built. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of unintended consequences. And I want to be very clear from, from a personal standpoint, we all lose if we fail. If we, if we don't do anything about climate change or if we don't do enough about it, we lose. But, and I don't think we will lose, I think we'll solve it. Um, depending on the path we take to do that, we will create winners and losers. And they may not be equally distributed across US states. They may not be distrib equally distributed across countries. So I'll give you an example. If we wanted to do the easiest thing to make the biggest dent in greenhouse gas emissions in the US, we would shut down every coal-fired power plant, right? This is who loses if we do that, the states that produce a lot of coal. And we can extend that concern globally if we're talking about the petroleum industry. So let's imagine we get everything we want. We get a grid that's 100% renewable energy, and then we also electrify the world's vehicle fleet. Then we can knock off this other piece of the pie, right, which is the transportation sector. Who loses then? It's countries that produce a lot of oil. And I realize this is sort of an infamous list of countries. Um, but depending on the price of oil, some of these countries and countries that are not listed here derive 60% of their GDP from oil exports, which means 60% of funding for infrastructure and social programs. So I think it's important to recognize, even though we vilify some countries on this list, um, that if we get everything that we want, a grid that's 100% renewable energy and you know, electric autonomous vehicles that are affordable, that could have a destabilizing influence on certain parts of the world. So my main point is yes, 
the climate challenge is about as quickly as possible reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's also about adapting to the inevitable impacts of climate change that we will feel. And it's also about managing any social and economic fallout that comes from hopefully a rapid shift away from fossil fuels. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much for listening. And you know, if you want to, um, Runner, if you want to uh, continue to uh, engage and talk about uh, renewable energy, you can go to any solar farm anytime you want, and there's always panel discussions going on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> um, how many of you are familiar with the book uh, or the movie Merchants of Doubt? Okay. Naomi Oreski, I believe from Harvard, uh, wrote that, and I thought did an excellent job at showing the parallel between uh, uh, the tobacco executives that basically lied through their teeth about how tobacco wasn't harmful and some of the people that are denying climate change today. Um, but one of the things that, that disappointed me uh, recently is that uh, she called uh, Carrie Emanuel, who was our first town hall speaker last year, and three other prominent scientists, a new brand of climate denialists uh, because of the fact that um, Carrie and these other three people believe that nuclear power should be a part of the solution. And I, I, I couldn't help but think that, oh my gosh, we're, we're even arguing amongst ourselves that agree on the basic concept that man is having an influence on the climate and we're gonna demonize people that uh, disagree with our solutions? You know, that, that doesn't seem very productive uh, at all and, and reeks of having an agenda, if, if you think about it. So uh, I think that, again, all of these things are on the table and let's talk about it. All right, and speaking of somebody who does a lot of talking about this, Bob Inglis is our uh, second guest tonight. And uh, Bob is, uh, I guess he's one of my, uh, he's one of my heroes. I was gonna say heroes, but he really goes beyond that. Um, in the sense that we're talking about a conservative Republican that still is. I mean, he didn't go from being a conservative Republican to a flaming liberal, you know, he still is a conservative Republican, but he had enough courage to look at an issue and ask himself the question, could I be wrong about this? And, and did the research and did the homework and, and now, and, and paid a big political price for it but then has uh, basically started this group that is trying to convince conservatives that there's a great opportunity here and that maybe they're looking at it the wrong way. Uh, so six-term congressman from the reddest district in the reddest state, as he calls it, in South Carolina. And I wanna bring Bob up here and he can tell you his story better than I can. And then after that, we'll all gather over there and have a discussion. So, Bob. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if this works. And Seb, you gonna go with the mic? Yes, it is. It's gonna go. So that's uh, Greg says that uh, he admires my work. I really admire what Greg has done. You know, it takes some it, it's real risk taking to do what he's done on air, and I very much appreciate that. So whatever Greg Fischel asked me to do, I'm willing to do. It sounds a lot like what Tony Blair said to George W., doesn't it? But anyway, um, <laughs> well, some things I wouldn't be willing to do with you, Greg. I mean, maybe. anyhow, so I got to have some audience participation here right, to, right off the bat. Who here agrees with me that Ronald Reagan was a particularly good president? Okay, so now those hands, keep them up. Okay, these are the, these are the Reaganites. Now, and so you, you agree that Ronald Reagan is a particularly good president? And keep your hand up if you think climate change is real. And keep your hand up if you think it's human caused. Okay, so now, those hands still up. You are the most important people on the planet <laughs> to solving climate change because you are the game changers. Um, everybody else in the room, uh, go ahead and go home. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> Those that had their hands up, I need you at republicen.org. 
And I hope that before you leave here tonight, you sign up um, because you really are the game changers. You know, in the, in the play Oklahoma, they're going about as far as they can go. Well, I'm here to tell you the environmental left's going about as far as they can go. Uh, it's conservatives who will make the difference on climate change. Now, if you're a progressive, before you get upset with me, happy you're here, happy that you're involved. But really, you've got to find a conservative friend in order for this to work. Because honest to goodness, you've gone about as far as you can go. And so it takes finding those people who had their hands up there at the end. Now, I noticed some drop off in the hands there that talked that Reagan was a good president, but they weren't sure about climate change. So I'm very happy that you're here because the hard questions Greg is going to answer about climate change or um, Dr. Kern over there, um, I'll be talking a little bit about three things. One is messengers. Second is MO, modus operandi. And then third is the message, all right? So first about the messengers, really, those people had their hands up at the end of that series. You're the most important people and the people who can message on this the best. So you are the most important messengers. We've got an organization that's trying to do that, uh, this thing called RepublicEN.org. And as Greg said, um, I'm still a conservative. Now, some people might doubt that, so let me give you some numbers. American Conservative Union rating, uh, lifetime rating, 93. Is that an A, Dr. Kern, at Chapel Hill? It is. OK, good. It's still an A at, at Chapel Hill. All right, so 100% um, uh, Christian Coalition, 100% National Right to Life, A with the NRA, zero with the Americans for Democratic Action, and 23 by some mistake with the AFL-CIO. I was really hoping for a zero. Um, and I'd like a recount on that. Um, uh, so pretty conservative guy, right? And oh, by the way, low rated by every environmental group to include Republicans for environmental protection. I think I had an F with them. Um, I mean, it, it absolutely low rated. Um, so um, for six years, this uh, messenger said that climate change was nonsense. Al Gore's imagination. I knew nothing about it, except that he was for it. And that was the end of the inquiry. Um, if you've seen Merchants of Doubt, you know that Robbie Kenner took Naomi Reska's book, and he sort of shortened up what I'm about to tell you about a met metamorphosis into one step. It's actually three steps. But Robbie wasn't doing a film about the life and times of Bob Inglis, so he had to move along, you know? But here are the three steps that turned that guy uh, who for six years in Congress said is a bunch of hooey into somebody now who is on this mission to try to get conservatives to embrace action on climate change. First step for me was my son coming to me. I'd been out of Congress for six years doing commercial real estate law in Greenville, South Carolina. And then I ran again in 04. My son had just turned 18. He was voting for the first time. And so he came to me and he said, Dad, I'll vote for you. But you're going to clean up your act on the environment. His four sisters agreed. His mother agreed. Had a new constituency. Um, uh, so you know they could all change the locks on the doors. Very important to respond to them. And so I, um, that was step one. By the way, some people think that my son was making some sort of a threat, sort of like an interest group kind of deal. That is not what my son was doing. It would not have been in his economic interest to vote against me. I mean, we were mortgaging the farm, all right? And so Robert was going to vote for me no matter what. What he's really saying is, Dad, I love you. And you can be better than you were in the last six years. So come on, get with it. That's what he was saying. And because I'm trying to grow up to be like my son, you know, a lot of sons are trying to grow up to be like their father. I'm trying to grow up to be like my son. He's good looking. He's fun, he's smart, he's funny, he's everything I'd like to be. So I'm trying to grow up to be like Robert. And um, so that was step one. Step two was getting on the science committee, going to Antarctica, seeing the evidence in the ice core drillings. We'll get into that if you want to, the Q&A. Um, step three was a spiritual awakening for me. Uh, it was another science committee trip, Great Barrier Reef, uh, snorkeling with an Aussie climate scientist. And without any words, I could tell that Scott Heron and I shared a worldview. 
You know, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. And so Scott was preaching the gospel. I could see it in his eyes. I could, I could read it on his face. I could hear it in his voice. We'd go down, he'd show me something, and he'd come back to the surface, and he'd be so excited about God's creation. And he'd be telling me about it. And so I knew we shared a worldview before any words. Later we talked, and he told me about conservation changes he was making in his life in order to love God and love people. People will never know because they'll come along after us. So Scott rides his bike to work. He takes the stairs, not elevators. He tries to live without air conditioning in Townsville, Australia, as long as his wife and three daughters can survive it. Um, and uh, so um, I got right inspired. I came home and introduced the Raise Wages, Cut Carbon Act of 2009 because I wanted to be like Scott, loving God, loving people, and offering an alternative to cap and trade, which I was planning to vote against and did, in fact, vote against. Um, and so, uh, because I thought it was hopelessly complicated, embarrassing for the free allocations of the well-connected, uh, a massive tax increase, it would have decimated American manufacturing. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was it play? Um, so, I mean, so for those reasons, I voted against cap and trade, but I proposed the alternative, right? Note to self, do not introduce carbon tax in midst of great recession. It will not go well for you in, as Greg said, I claim to be the reddest district in the reddest state of the nation, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Anybody want to fight me for that distinction here? I mean, anybody in North Carolina want to say you're redder than we are in uh, Greenville, Spartanburg, South Carolina? I, I mean, there's some people in Texas that want to fight me for that, or Idaho. Well, I don't think you got me here in North Carolina. I think we're redder than you are. Um, so pretty red district, right? And so what happened is this guy that went on to some fame in Benghazi, called Trey Gowdy, got 71% of the vote in a Republican runoff, and I got 29% of the vote. So after, 20, after 12 years in Congress, I was tossed out. Now, I had committed some other heresies, by the way. I was against a troop surge in Iraq because I had conservative concerns about nation building in Iraq. I was for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we didn't call it that, but I was for that. Um, and uh, I voted for TARP, which can never be forgiven by the Tea Party. But the most enduring heresy was just saying that climate change is real, let's do something about it. Because it seemed that I'd gone to the other side, crossed to the other team. And uh, so um, after, at that point, um, some folks came to me and said, you know, you are very unusual, an actual conservative who says climate change is real. Because most of the time, if you've got somebody claiming to be conservative and they're talking about climate change, you're usually really a mushy moderate, right? Um, but they said, no, no, you're really a conservative. This is really unusual. Well, you speak and write for the proposition. So started doing that. We've now got three folks in D.C., one in Wisconsin, because I know Paul Ryan knows that this is the right policy, uh, one in Illinois, because we're after the low-hanging fruit of moderates in the Chicago suburbs. I play a moderate when I'm in Chicago. I'm not very good at it, but I play it. Um, and then uh, we're in Florida. We've got one person in Florida because of the felt need there. Two of us live and work from South Carolina. So eight of us in this little operation called RepublicEN.org. All those people are conservatives. Some of them are libertarians. Some of them are Republicans. But all conservative who passionately believe that this is about free enterprise and an opportunity. And to answer the question of the evening, you bet there's a bright future for renewables. You bet there's a free enterprise opportunity in it. There's jobs, there's wealth creation, and uh, there's cleaner air coming our way. So those are the mess that's about the messengers. Our MO, if I can make this go, oh, there, there's, there's who we are, Republic EN. Uh, that's what I want those people with their hands up to go to before this night is over. Um, listen to these words and see if they found, sound familiar. If it plays, if it doesn't, I'm going to have to imitate the Gipper. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with, privately with General Secretary Gorbachev, when you stop to think that we're all God's children, wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from outside in the universe. 
we'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together. Well, I don't suppose we can wait for some alien race to come down and threaten us, but I think that between us we can bring about that realization. So we've obviously added the <clears throat> video and the images. The sound, uh, one of those libertarians on my team found, and because she really loves Reagan, um, and it's interesting, this was his most fresh uh, statement of this. He, he said it three, two more, three more times, and each time it got a little bit more polished. But this is that wonderful, unpolished Reagan where he says, well, and uh, all of that stuff. Later at the UN, he sort of cleaned it up and it got a little bit smoother. But we found it just a fascinating statement of well, except for the Nancy Reagan and some stuff that maybe some people would wonder about whether she was doing astrology there with him with the aliens coming or something. But anyway, um, the point being that there's the Gipper talking about this threat that we think applies to climate change. So he's not a current messenger of that, but our MO here, modus operandi, is to help conservatives hear that voice and apply it to climate change. Here's another one that we like to... Uh, to hear from. I'm an economist, and I'm agnostic with respect to global warming. I'm a conservative who says it's real. I'm not a geologist. I'm not a climatologist. I don't know whether it is. But what I do know is that a carbon tax or cap and trade or some of these other ideas, as they have been put forth, they ruin the economy. Either way, whether you're agnostic or you think climate change is real, the solution may just be the same, and that's changing what you tax. If you're going to handle global warming, you can do it in a way that actually does not hurt the economy. Uh, in fact, if it's done correctly, it might even be a better tax scheme than not. What if we were to reduce taxes on income and shift the tax onto pollution? I would bet that a carbon tax really would be less damaging dollar for dollar to the economy than the progressive income tax. you got to tax something to fund the government. Why not make it pollution rather than income? Something we want more of, and as opposed to something we want less of. What if we did that by eliminating all subsidies for all fuels and attaching all costs to all fuels, following a free enterprise principle of accountability? Then what we'd see is a free enterprise system delivering the fuels of the future, not with clumsy government mandates and fickle tax incentives. Conservatives know there's no such thing as a free lunch. We're already paying all the cost of all the fuels. It's just we don't pay at the meter, and we don't pay at the pump. If we did, we'd see our need. Entrepreneurs would be able to deliver a solution of new innovations. We're not buying into apocalyptic visions. We're talking reasonable risk avoidance and winning the triple play of this American century, improving our national security, creating jobs, cleaning up the air. If there is a threat of global warming, I know there are ways of dealing with it that can really make sure that the economy is not damaged. More income? Less pollution, change what you tax, and watch the free enterprise system deliver the fuels of the future. So, Art Laffer, of course, is the, of the Laffer curve, is who you're just watching there. Um, and um, he, he added his name to a piece that I wrote in 2008. The New York Times took it. We quoted Vice President Al Gore, and now I'll speak to the progressives in the room. Uh, cone of silence descends, so none of the conservatives hear this. The uh, uh, Art Laffer is a, neg is a neighbor of Al Gore's in Nashville, Tennessee. Art has been over to Al's house. They talked it through and they came to the conclusion that that tax swap we were just talking about, they both agree on. And so it was one of the things that inspired me to act, is if we can have um, Al Gore and Art Laffer agreeing, surely we can bring America together. That's the idea. To continue our MO, you see, we, we do these kind of ads that, uh, on Facebook that hopefully are a little bit fun and uh, keep conservatives looking for this opportunity to prove that free enterprise can solve climate change. And that, by the way, this ad we found out is uh, this statement is, is surprisingly the most powerful one we found, is simply that you're not alone. Uh, because conservatives assume that if they're concerned about climate change, they're odd. 
and the loud mouths in the room that tell us we can't believe that have to be kowtowed to. And so what we've found is that this um, unbinds some people so that they can come and tell us to be part of it. And of course, we do some things with Teddy Roosevelt. Um, Alex Bosmoski of our team is going to be at the convention next week with some Teddy mask. Um, and so it's going to have, it's got his uh, hair and some glasses and a nose and a mustache. And uh, the idea is to uh, make Teddy proud of you. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll leave that up there for those folks who had their hands up at the end. But uh, so you can sign up. Love for you to do it before you leave here. So I've told you about the messengers. I've told you about the MO, which is all this, about reaching to conservatives with conservative messaging. And then let, let me just conclude here with the, the message. The message is simply this, that free enterprise can solve climate change. If we just put all the cost in on all the fuels and eliminate all the subsidies. It's what the economist in the room will know as, uh, and would say, well, English, you're using so many words. Why don't you just tell them to internalize the negative externalities? Well, here, Dr. Economist, is why I don't say that everywhere, because I was once saying that to the Greenville News Reporter, the largest newspaper in the district that I represented. I said something about internalizing negative externalities. He said, what would you say, Bob? And I said, internalize the negative externalities. He said, I can't put that in this paper, man. We write at the seventh grade level. And I said, OK, reveal the hidden cost. He said, yep, I can put that. So, um, so it's basically revealing the hidden cost. It's putting all the cost in on the fuels, eliminating all the subsidies. Now, that makes us quite strange in this field, I will tell you. Because normally, the people that are talking about climate change are from the environmental left. And they talk about, essentially, and, and I know this is going to be offensive to some who are on the environmental left, but let me just help you hold a mirror so you can see, it, see yourself in a conservative mirror. What a conservative sees in you is somebody who wants us all to walk and eat bugs, to do with less, <laughs> and that this is some apocalyptic thing that we're facing. And it sounds to us like a new religion. And so no wonder we're offended by that. Because we, we already got our religion. We don't want your climate change religion. And so uh, if I can just hold that mirror for you, you can see it. And, and there's big business in this, too. And now I may be really stepping on some toes of even some people that work for some of these organizations, where they send out the mailer saying, save the polar bear. And well, that works real well, because there are a bunch of liberal mamas and papas, and they'll write a $35 check. Meanwhile, across the street, that conservative household, they're completely offended by that message. Because you know what? If Sarah were to shoot that thing and put it right in front of the fireplace, that might be a good place for it. You know, is that, that's what uh, a lot of the people across the street are thinking, right? And so somehow, we have got to reach the people across the street. And it cannot be walking across the street and telling them, listen, won't you come to our church of climate change? They don't want to come to that church. What they, want, what they will come, though, is if you go to them and say, do you believe that free enterprise could solve climate change? And the thing not to ask them, if I could implore you, if you're the progressive household that's going to walk across the street to the conservative household, is please don't ask them if they believe in climate change. Because you know what? If they answer yes, then they're cutting themselves off from their community. And humans need to be part of a community. So rather than asking it that way, just ask, can free enterprise solve climate change? Because I defy that household, just like I defy any politician serving in Washington on the Republican Party, to say that climate change, or that, that say that free enterprise can't solve problems. Because if you're a conservative, you believe that free enterprise can solve problems that you don't even have. You may not have an ingrown toenail, but free enterprise can solve it if you did. And if there's a climate change problem, like you heard Art Laffer saying, free enterprise can fix it. So it's a matter of changing the vocabulary, reaching out, and finding some way to bring America together, a little bit like the way that Art Laffer went over to Al Gore's house and talked it through and came to the conclusion it works for both of them. I hope we can come to that conclusion before we leave here tonight. And, and 
do join Republican. Uh, stand with us. Let me stop there, and uh, we'll move to questions, I guess. Okay. I've, been a, I've been assigned this seat, so you can <laughs> set up the other two any way you want. I feel comfortable on the far right up here. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> And you're the moderate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Registered independent. There you go. So I'm going to start off here uh, uh, with asking uh, Jordan. I was going to start off with you. Sure. Uh, you know, clean energy, we see signs of it now uh, all around us. Uh, we see uh, people with solar panels. Uh, one of my colleagues, Mike Mays, did that a couple of years ago. Uh, we see the electric cars. Uh, uh, I've been dry, driving a hybrid for several years now. Um, wind turbines. So there are signs of it all around, but certainly it's not our primary source of energy right. at, at this point, not, not even close. So I guess my question for you as we start off here is, uh, how far away are we from it becoming the majority source of energy, and is there a preferred rate at which we do that to minimize the losers that you talked about? Okay. Um, so I think the, the transition will happen, uh, the, the speed at which that happens depends ultimately on federal policy, whether or not we have a cap carbon tax or some concerted effort that applies to all states equally. Um, in absence of that, it will be up to individual states, and more interested states will transition quickly, more quickly than others. For example, California. Um, as far as a preferred rate, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think the the backstop is cost, right? So as soon as renewable energy. Uh, falls below the cost of fossil electricity from fossil fuels, then it's at parity, right? So then all things equal, uh, a utility should be indifferent, right, about what they build. Now, of course, variable renewable energy is not the same as a natural gas turbine because you can control a natural gas turbine. So there's engineering requirements that hold things up as well. But in theory, as soon as the cost is equal, then we should be indifferent. The other issue with that I, I brought up is the, the financial inertia. Um, you know, there is going to be a resistance to switching as long as the fossil fuel stuff's on the books. So it's those two things, I think, that are, that are the main hang-up. I, I mean, the part of this answer, you know, depends on the rate at which innovation continues. You know, if tomorrow we wake up and renewable energy is just dirt cheap, that helps speed things along quite a bit. We were talking at, at dinner about, you know, when John Kennedy made his speech about going to the moon in 62, right, uh, that... We didn't have a clue how to do that. Right. And there, there had to be some engineers who were sweating bullets, you know, like, we're going to do that in seven years? Uh-huh, sure. Um, but we did uh, with six months to spare. And uh, so are you confident that, that uh, the United States or China or maybe everybody in between can uh, really come up with some innovative technology so that we can do things in five or ten years that we could only dream about today. I am, and, and the reason uh, is because of greed. Uh, not greed, but, uh, you know, ambition motivated by dollar signs. Uh, you know, I think the difference between the, the moonshot and this is there are trillions of dollars on the line. You know, if, if an innovator comes up with a better technology, um, they win. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Bob, and I'm, I'm going to refer to my notes here. Um, these town halls are conducted in a science museum, and so obviously the subject matter addressed in each of them should be primarily science. Uh, but like it or not, uh, at least this part of science has become highly politicized uh, in recent years and decades. And... Uh, I guess the, the, the question that I just wanted to follow up with you is that why, or how, how were you willing, I guess, to, and, 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 and were you aware at the time that you changed your mind about climate change? Did you ever in your wildest dreams think that the political fallout would be as severe as it was, as quick as it was? Or did you know ahead of time that that was a, a big risk you were taking? 
I, I knew it was a risk. Um, and, uh, you know, I, people have asked, well, why'd you do it then? You know, why, well, it's, I always thought there was going to come a moment in that 2010 cycle when people would appreciate uh, sort of truth telling. But that moment quite never didn't quite come, you know. And so, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, you you have a picture of that. You know, I was once uh, campaign breakfast, and this guy stands up. He's so angry. He says, "The president is so unpatriotic. He doesn't put his hand over his heart when the pledge is recited. The national anthem is played." And he sat down in total disgust. And so I'm standing there, and I'm thinking. I know it would work right now. What do you expect from a secret Muslim, uh, non-American, socialist? Any of those would have done just fine at that moment, right? <laughs> I mean, I would have been completely ingratiated to the crowd. And so I'm standing there thinking, can't do it, won't do it. Um, and so I said, uh, you know, I've been with the president. I've seen him put his hand over his heart. What you've just said is simply not true. Yeah, I said, the president is a loyal, patriotic American who loves his country, loves his wife, loves his kids. I just disagree with him on most everything. Um, afterwards, this Republican operative came up to me and said, don't give him that. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, uh, but I, I, the answer, Greg, is why I did that and why, why I uh, had to switch on climate change is I had to go home that night. Somebody asked, why did you do it? Well, I had to go home. And at home were five kids that, you know, my wife and I have been telling all these years, you know, always do the right thing, you know, whatever. And so, except when political expedience demands, you know, attacking the secret Muslim non-American socialist or something. <laughs> so, uh, just, you know, so that's, um, so th what it boils down to is just uh, love is what made me do it. Love my kids and, uh, and uh, then, you know, the love of really important friendships like uh, Scott Heron in Australia. Um, and and their, that, uh, their affections mean more to me than the very temporary, and I can assure you they are very temporary affections of, uh, of a political base. <laughs> Believe you me, those are temporary affections. Um, I learned the, uh, when I lost the Senate race in 1998, there's only one person ever said I do, I do to me. And uh, it wasn't the voters. They did not say I do. Um, and so <laughs> only Marianne said that to me. <laughs> well, it's, you know, and I, I think I may have told this story last time. It's a short one. But uh, one of the neatest memories I have of my mom uh, is that uh, she was not a big Richard Nixon fan at all. And uh, she was none too happy about the results of the 1968 election. And uh, in 1970, uh, Nixon came to the Lancaster, Pennsylvania airport to give a speech. And uh, she came to me, I was 13 at the time, and uh, she said, uh, do you want to go up to the airport to see Nixon give a speech? And I just sort of looked at her and said, but you don't like him. And she said, but he's our president and he deserves our support. Huh. And I don't think she meant that she had to agree with him on anything, yeah. but the decision had been made uh, he's the leader of the free world, and let's go up and listen to him and see if there isn't something we can do together to make the country better. And I just don't see a lot of that going on in this, in this day and age. Um, Jordan, going back to you for a second here, um, as I mentioned earlier, I was really uh, impressed with your uh, desire to be objective about um, you know, the fact that there are winners and losers in this transition. Um, do you think that, the, that those of us that accept the science of climate change, the fact that man is playing a role, are we showing enough concern and empathy for the potential losers uh, in this transition? I mean, do we, are we so gung-ho on something that we are very convicted about, that we need to do something about, that we're, not, we're forgetting about the people, even though it may be a minority, that are going to be hurt initially by this? I don't know. Um, I, I like to think that if people are aware of the potential for somebody to lose a lot as a part of the transition, they wouldn't ignore it. So I don't know if it's uh, willful ignorance or just ignorance, or I'm not sure. You know, with students, the thing I notice is that um, it's so complex an issue, they can wrap their head around the emergency, 
right? We've got to do something about this. Uh, and uh, they're young, which means, you know, they're going to feel the impacts of climate change for sure. And it's a generational issue. So the thing I, I come across with them is that maybe just a, a little bit of a failure to appreciate complexity. Uh, and I suppose that probably extends to most people. It's an amazingly complicated issue um, that will be multi-generational. It'll reach across many different sectors. And I think that's part of the tragedy, is that it's, it's too complicated to get everybody on the same page. Uh, sometimes it just works to sell a simpler message um, and just put out one fire at a time. So. I don't know. Okay. Um, let's see, I'm going to uh, just refer, and then I'm going to get to some of the audience questions here. Um, there has been uh, statements made uh, by a lot of people saying that uh, uh, if we make this transition, Bob, that it's going to not only destroy our economy, but uh, cause, uh, I guess, what's called eco-poverty or uh, environmental poverty, uh, you know, in other parts of the world. And we've seen examples, like with cell phones, uh, that developing countries sort of leapfrogged over the landlines. And, you know, why go through that process like we did if we can just get you there quickly? Um, is that a possibility here as well? You know, you, I know you talked about, like, Saudi Arabia and a lot of those other countries and so forth. Is there a possibility that we can avoid doing that kind of economic damage both to ourselves and to developing countries? Yeah, I think there really is. Uh, it, it proves the, the case that, uh, you know, Steve Forbes, when he was running for president, said that uh, capitalism is that system where you make money by serving your customer. And we have an incredible opportunity and calling, really, to serve some people in some dark places of the world to develop for them distributed energy systems, better solar cells, better batteries, that will make it so that their villages, which are currently dark at night, can have their students studying under lights and contributing their creativity to the world's creativity. It's an incredible opportunity. Um, and it will come from the wealthy countries of the world. And this is where too much is given, much will be required. There is an incredible calling here for the rich places like the Research Triangle Park to help create that kind of technological advance so that they can leapfrog us. We assume they're going to have this great big grid that we've got. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be a microgrid for them. And maybe they, just like you said, Greg, they leap, leapfrogged us on cell phone technology. They can leapfrog us on energy. And so what an incredible calling for especially young people thinking about what their life's going to be about. You know what? Uh, I work with a whole bunch of millennials. I got a bunch of millennial children. And what I believe to be true about them, and this is borne out in some polling data, is they want not only to make money, but they want their life to be about something, which is probably true of every human being, but it seems particularly expressed by the millennial generation. And so what an incredible opportunity and energy to light up the whole world with more energy, more mobility, more freedom. And of course, back to that, if I can hold the mirror again for any progressives, this is a conservative mirror being held up. When, when you talk about scarcity and doing with less, do you see how that doesn't fit with that? So you flip that mirror around, you say, what does it look like if you want to be a conservative and you want to be this person who's going to go serve customers around the world by giving them this new technology? Of course, making money while you do it, uh, which is great because we create jobs, we make money. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. Um, and so um, it, it's, it's a very exciting possibility and, and, and something that really fits and resonates with conservatives uh, because it, uh, it should. It, it's it's what, our, what our story is. I was at a, uh, the AMS Broadcasting Conference, American Meteorological Society. Uh, and you all know the story about the acronyms, right? The, there was this guy I heard give a talk years ago that he said, we have too many acronyms in the world, and so I'm going to create a no-acronym project or a NAP. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, there was, we were on a panel and there was uh, 
one guy that was not sold on the idea that man was having a significant influence on the climate, but he was concerned about the fact that we'd gotten away from the think globally, act locally, uh, that, that he said that there were still all things that we could do on a local level to help. And one example he gave was that his office is in a, I guess, a, a strip mall or whatever, and he walked by this one uh, office and the whole window was covered with condensation. So he walked inside and he asked the, the lady at the desk, uh, what temperature are you told to set this place at when you leave at night? And she said, 75. And so in his very charming way, he gave her a little mini lesson on dew points. And uh, by the end of the discussion, he uh, or she decided that I'm gonna set that thermostat at 77 when I leave here tonight and just see if I can see out the window tomorrow morning. <laughs> And uh, you know, just little things like that, uh, trips he took every day, he, he put them into Google Maps and found out there was a shorter route uh, that he could take. Um, so, uh, and, and so I took part in that panel with him, even though we have some disagreement on, on the climate thing, is that I think he's right that there's an awful lot of small things that all of us can do on a day-to-day -day basis to you know, conserve, conserve energy. All right, we got some questions from the audience here. Um, what is the most important action that government can take to encourage clean energy at the state and federal level? Carbon tax. Carbon tax. <laughs> Wait a minute, no, it's like this. Revenue neutral, <laughs> border adjustable. Carbon tax. Um, pay no attention to those last two words, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> pay attention to the first two compound adjectives. Revenue neutral, border adjustable. And then it is a carbon tax. But um, it, because you know, who wants to pay more taxes, right? But revenue neutral means you're going to cut taxes somewhere else. So there's no growth of government. Um, border adjustable means it's applied to imports. So that we, if we win the WTO case, and I admit that that is a conditional, we've got to win the WTO case when China challenges it. But if we win it, I believe that within 24 hours of that victory, China, because they have an amazing way of reaching consensus, as you know, um, will impose the same price on carbon dioxide as we've got. Reason? They're importing flat steel through Philadelphia. They're remitting the tax on landing to the United States government in Washington, D.C. If they had had the same tax in China, they would have remitted that money to Beijing. Governments everywhere want more money. So they will impose the same tax internal to China. And then the whole world will follow suit without any UN agreement, without any bowing and scraping, you know, and, and endless negotiations at the UN. The US just making a bold commercial move saying, we're gonna, we're gonna do this and we'll meet you in court at the WTO to prove that we can do it to you on entry. And if we win, it'll be in your interest to do it. And then, then, then we've got the whole world going to truer cost of energy, and not this false cost. We've got a false cost of energy. It doesn't have all the cost in it. It doesn't have the health cost from all the soot. It doesn't have the climate cost in the price at the meter and at the pump. You put those things at the meter and the pump, yes, the prices go up, but if you've got a tax cut somewhere else, you're doing all right. But mostly it means that then innovation happens because all kinds of new technologies become, become uh, economic that are currently not economic except with props of various sorts. And so um, uh, it's, again, consistent with what, say, Milton Friedman would say if he were here right now. He'd say, what do you do about pollution? You tax it. That's what you do to it. Um, you don't try to regulate is what, what uh, Milton Friedman said. You tax it. Okay. Um, what is the panel's opinion of peak load pricing? On the retail level. So, yes. Okay. I, you know, I think the, the idea behind um, any sort of time of use pricing, which we don't really have in North Carolina, which is the whole idea is that uh, during the day, the price of electricity we pay would change to reflect the fact that actually the wholesale price of electricity changes during the day, we just don't know it, right? Other states have time of use uh, pricing. And the, the advantage there, I mean, peak, peak pricing would encourage people to use less during peak hours of the day because it would cost you more to use electricity then. The real 
really cool part about time of use pricing comes when you start integrating lots of renewable energy. Because if you're adding a lot of solar and wind to certain periods of the day, for example, solar, if you're just adding more and more solar, you get this big trough in the middle of the day of electricity demand where nobody's consuming that much electricity from coal plants or nuclear, and the price goes way down. So everybody moves when they're, you know, shifts when they're using uh, electricity to when the price is lowest, which is when solar is magically available. So it has this sort of way to get, get uh, past the whole problem of variable renewable energy. So that's, I mean, that's eventually where everything's going to go. Uh, instead of having to use batteries, have consumers change when they're using electricity and have that decision be based on price. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. I'm not <clears throat> sure I can make out all the words here. How do we overcome, uh, I'm not sure I can read, the, something in my backyard mentality. Maybe I do know what that word is. <laughs> Um, of our elected officials when it comes to eliminating roadblocks or providing incentives for clean energy in our area, particularly wind energy. And this may be in reference to, to I guess, the fact that the solar incentive went away mm -hmm. in North Carolina earlier this year. Uh, people that I knew that went solar prior to this year got almost everything back yeah. in, in incentives and, and tax credits, and uh, now not so much that way. but. Uh, do you think that's the, still the way to go? Or I know that you, you favor level the, leveling the playing field and, and, and not having those types of things. Yeah, we, we think we should eliminate all of those things. Um, that means eliminate all subsidies. And here's what we do. We, we, we say to the Tea Party, no more cylindras. Right! They say back. And then we say, and no more production tax credit for wind. Right! And we say, no more electric car credits. Right. And we say, no more under market leases on public land for the extraction of minerals. <laughs> and uh, there's sort of a, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, and then we say, and no more the biggest subsidy of them all, which is being able to belch and burn into the trash dump of the sky without paying a tipping fee. Well, so far it's crickets over there, right? I mean, we, we're not getting much back from them just yet. But we think that eventually that will be understood to be the biggest subsidy of them all, is this ability to belch and burn into the sky for free. You know, if, I'm sure the dumps here have a tipping fee. If you're a trash hauler, you gotta pay the fee in order to take up space in that dump. Otherwise, the city of Raleigh is socializing my trash, uh, trash hauling business. They're, they're helping my business by letting me dump for free in the city dump. No, they charge me for the space. And then I've got to back that up and charge my customers for hauling their trash away, right? Well, that's as it should be. Because, you know, in the salad bar of life, take what you want, but pay for what you take, right? And so if you're going to take up space in the city dump, pay for it. If you're going to dump into the trash dump of the sky, pay for the marginal harm you're causing by that dumping. That's the internalization of the negative externality. And then the economics change. Then you, would, then you wouldn't have my sister-in-law who has a vault, and I cover her vault. I mean, if you want to know the truth, I confess my sin. I covet her vault. I want one, all right? Um, <laughs> I don't have one. I got kids in college. Um, so, uh, um, but someday I'll have a vault, but it will be not because there's a $7,500 credit for it, but because it made sense to get a vault. And it made sense to have a battery in my garage and to put solar cells on my barn. It makes sense because the economics work. Without anybody trying to lead me around by the nose with some temporary incentive that goes away such that one neighbor gets this sweet deal um, with and it. I don't. And the other one doesn't because they didn't act fast enough or something or they weren't in the know. That's it's just not the way to do it. It's just level the playing field and make it so that uh, all the costs are in, all subsidies are gone, and then you've got a steady business. And if you're in the solar installation business, you can see your future going up that way rather than in this bumpy ride like, oh my gosh, if they don't, you know, like the wind people, they get near-death experience every time Congress has to extend the production tax credit. If they don't, the industry dies. 
Well, it wouldn't be that way. It'd be like, I, I can see how I'm going to succeed in this wind business for 20 years to come. I am really glad about, they're happy to have received this next question here because it means that at least one person answered my call this week. <laughs> there have been four ice ages in the United States. They all melted due to natural warming without man burning coal or wood. How do you know the current warming cycle is not 99% natural and not man caused? I told you the hard question. It's coming <laughs> to you, Greg. You're the scientist. Uh, no, I'll take a crack at you. Tell me whether you're whether I'm right. It's, it's one of the one of the explanations as ice ages is, uh, might be so, solar activity, right? right, and decline in the sol in the sun. Well, if that were happening, and this is my friend Jim Inhofe, and he is a friend, um, says it's all sun activity that's causing the warming. Well, the problem with that is the data doesn't support that view. The sun is actually in a declining period. And so um, the eruptions from that, that wonderful hydrogen bomb that's going on up in the sky um, it, it is not giving us as much energy as would be indicated by the warming. In fact, we should be cooling right now. And so um, that's one of the things that's off. In other words, it, 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 it's not solar activity. It doesn't seem to, the correlation is quite weak there. The correlation is very strong with the green, presence of greenhouse gases. Um, and now, of course, correlation does not equal causation, right? But in this Petri dish that we're all living in, at some point you have to just go with some is some degree of comfort with the fact that you'll never prove causation. For example, it, if you watch Merchants of Doubt, you cannot say smoking causes cancer or, or, or smoking will cause cancer for you if you smoke. I mean, if you smoke, you will get cancer. That cannot be asserted, right? Because you might not. Your lungs might be such that they can take it. But the correlation is extremely high that if you smoke, you're going to get cancer. So you can't wait around for proof on something like that. In other words, in your individual case, you have to act on the information you've got as a precautionary principle, which I'm speaking to conservatives here. I hope we recognize that precautionary principle. It's something that really makes sense to conservative personalities. And by the way, apologies for always, for if you're progressive, and I'm always talking about the conservatives here, but it's because we believe that what we have here is an undeserved inferiority complex. Conservatives think we're no good when it comes to energy and climate. So when the topic comes up, we shrink in science denial. It's so like. You know, Jordan here keeps asking me about running a marathon with him. Well, I don't want to run a marathon with Jordan. He looks like he can run a marathon. I don't want to do it. <laughs> All right? So every time he brings it up, I change the subject. Well, that's us conservatives on climate change. Every time you progressives bring it up, we change the subject because we don't think we're any good. So what we live to do at Republican.org is say, no, you're very good. Raise your hand in class. You're the kid that's got the answer. Just internalize the negative externalities. And you know, I, I know that, that models uh, are a dirty word for a lot of folks that, uh, you know, oh, you're just basing this on models, there's no science to it and all this. Well, models are an incredibly useful tool in the sense that they can do calculations in a fraction of the time that we could do it by hand. And a lot of times models aren't used to forecast the future, they're used to hindcast. How can we replicate something that has happened before. And when they do that with these models, the only way they can replicate the temperature trend that we have observed is by the introduction of greenhouse gases. Um, the uh, amount of solar irradiance, which you mentioned, is on the decline. So there's, there is no, no correlation there. But here's, and I may have mentioned this in the last town hall, and for those of you that were here and, and heard me, I apologize for repeating it. But in the last few months, I've thought a lot about the fact that I hear people say, you can't prove that we're going to warm up a certain amount by this year. And you know what my answer to that is? You're absolutely right. I can't. Okay? Guilty as charged. But why don't you try to prove to me that it's zero risk? 
Prove to me beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is absolutely no risk here at all. And if you can't do that, then we have entered into the world of risk assessment by definition. And now we have to decide how much we're willing to tolerate. And a simple analogy to that might be you have a two-year-old daughter and somebody says there's a 5% chance if you let her cross the street by herself, she's going to get run over and killed. Do you take that risk? If you have reservations at a restaurant, there's a 10% chance you're going to get food poisoning. Do you keep the reservation? <laughs> you know, those are fairly low probabilities, but probably enough that people would take action the other way. So I don't think the burden of proof, I mean, scientists are, are doing the best they can with the best knowledge we have to try to figure this out. Is there a chance that it turns out to be not such a big deal and that you know, that maybe we don't have a climate catastrophe or something like that? Yeah, there is. So what are we left with? Cleaner air, renewable energy. Those aren't things that are really bad. <laughs> and a better economy if you do right. it right, as Art Laffer said up there. Right. So anyway, I, but, but I, I really do appreciate the, uh, the question because I... That's really my goal in this whole thing is to, is to prove we can have civil discussions about things that we, uh, that we don't see eye to eye on. And if we all, you know, the scientific method, I think I've mentioned this in every one, I, I love the basics of it, is that it's okay to have a hypothesis. We're all entitled to those. They're free and they're legal, okay? Um, but we're supposed to test them, and the best way to test them is to try to prove ourselves wrong. And I think we live in an age right now where we're sort of jumping from step one to step three. We have a hypothesis, let's just equate it to a conclusion and so don't mess with that testing part. Because there's a chance that test might prove you wrong. Well, it's not such a bad thing. If, if you're proven wrong, you've learned something. You've acquired additional knowledge. That's something to be proud of, not, not ashamed of. We all can time? No, <laughs> we need to quit. <laughs> so anyways, well, I hope that we've at least um, scratch the surface here a little bit. Thanks so much to both of you for, uh, for coming here tonight and having a discussion. We're going to have a reception uh, outside uh, where you can talk to some folks. And I think I had a note here. Uh, maybe I... Oh, here it is. It fell. That I wanted to make sure you were aware of uh, some folks that are outside. Uh, the team in the city of Raleigh's Office of Sustainability, some of that team is going to be out in the lobby and uh, you can talk to them about some of the things that they're doing. Um, uh, the city identified the importance of renewable energy in the 2012 Climate Energy Action Plan, CAP. It has to be an acronym for everything. Uh, you can find the renewal re renewable report on both the city of Raleigh and the NCSEA's websites. And uh, so, again, check with them out, uh, out there and, uh, and uh, talk with them. We'll be available. And uh, thank you all for coming so much tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, just let me uh, add appreciation from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and our, on behalf of our sponsor for this town hall series, Capital Broadcasting. And also just to reflect, uh, since I mentioned Albert Einstein's quote at the beginning about the importance of asking questions, I think you all would make Albert Einstein proud that you've all been asking questions. And we realize the more questions we ask, the greater complexity of the issue at hand. But we, make, we only make advances if we probe what we think we know, as has been said repeatedly by asking questions. So I would like to thank you on behalf of the team of staff in community engagement and the featured programs team and our AV team for, uh, for coming this evening and, and engaging with this. There is an evaluation that we'd like you to complete and there are those uh, uh, exhibitors that we'd like you to sort of have some interaction with and take some of the literature home. Above all, and what? And refreshments, <laughs> cookies and, and coffee and tea uh, to your left as you go out this door. So thank you very much for coming. And watch out for the next town hall, which will be on December the 1st. Is that right, Katie? Uh, on the sustainable development goal of life on land, uh, which will look in particular at how ecosystems in the Appalachians are shifting both altitudinally and latitudinally as uh, climate warms. So have a good evening, and thank you for joining us. Stay tuned. Thank you. And the coffee will keep you well grounded. <laughs> Nobody heard that. Very good. <laughs> All right. Well, that was great. Yeah, I thought... I thought...